Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Jess Lenore in Baltimore. DeRay McKesson might be a late entry into the Baltimore's mayor's race, but his candidacy has brought both national attention and controversy to a field already crowded with nearly a dozen Democrats alone. A Black Lives Matter protester who gained fame and a massive social media following by walking away from a six-figure salary in 2014 to join the Ferguson uprising, McKesson recently released a 26-page platform which outlined support for a $15 minimum wage, education development, youth development, and reforming the beleaguered Baltimore Police Department. At least on the surface, this sounds progressive, but critics say his involvement with Teach for America hints at another agenda. TFA is a hedge fund-backed nonprofit that gives top college graduates five weeks of training and places them in disinvested public schools around the country. TFA is known for rallying around its alumni, but there are others who paint a different picture. Among those is our next guest, T. Jameson Brewer. He's a PhD candidate of Educational Policy Studies and O'Leary Fellow at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He's also the co-editor of Teach for America Counter Narratives, Alumni Speak Up and Speak Out, published last year. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. My pleasure. So let's start off by, if you can just share a little bit of your own experience um, for, uh, with Teach for America and what you've heard from your, um, some of your other colleagues that have been critical of it. Um, and we're, we're ha we have you on because recently there was an article written about DeRay and um, it you know, pointed out his connections with Teach for America and it was pretty critical of those connections and what TFA has done um, around the country. And DeRay responded, he defended uh, TFA. It, it said, um, his response said, TFA uh, is working to get a quality good quality education for students all across the United States, um, that he believes in strong public schools and he believes in, in teachers unions and collective bargaining. Um, so you've had sort of a different experience and you've, had, you've learned different things from, from working with and talking to other former TFA alumni. Can you fill us in? Yeah, so I'm actually a traditionally trained teacher, uh, but I had the misfortune of graduating right as the recession started. And so after two years of looking for a job and the state of Georgia where I lived, uh, effectively having a hiring freeze across the board. Uh, I joined Teach for America um, out of desperation to find a job. And it was really during the first couple of days uh, of being at Institute that I, I started to develop a, a critical lens on Teach for America uh, because it, it seemed to me, and others have talked about this as well, that Teach for America's approach to pedagogy is very one size fits all. They never use the word recipe, but it's uh, presented to incoming core members, right? So these are folks who've had no experience or background in pedagogy or methods or child development um, necessarily. This recipe for teaching is presented to them, and they're told to follow that. And if they follow that, 100% of their students will achieve 100% of the time. And, you know, according to their academic impact model and their teaching as leadership rubric, you know, if students aren't achieving and if they're not behaving in the classroom, well, Teach for America's figured it out. Uh, the, the person that is to blame is the core member. And so some of my first critiques of the organization came from uh, an insider's perspective about how damaging that narrow uh, thinking about teaching and, and learning could be, not only uh, for students, but of course for the core members teaching them. And really, you know, Teach for America's message has shifted. Uh, it started as an organization uh, that purportedly wanted to attend to a national teacher shortage, but uh, especially in light of the economic recession and the you know, tens of thousands of teachers being laid off in Teach for America growing during those years, they've been forced to sort of shift their rhetoric uh, to, well, you know, we don't really attend to teacher shortages. Our teachers are better and principals are, are preferring our candidates over traditionally certified teachers. And what's troubling is that Teach for America, during the course of, as you pointed out, their five-week institute, they only get about 18 hours of student teaching. That's two and a half days of student teaching. And so for me, I found it problematic for an organization to suggest that they start student teaching Monday morning and they're better than everyone else by Wednesday at lunchtime. Uh, that's uh, disconcerting, it's problematic, uh, it's a bit insulting. Uh, and others, of course, uh, throughout the organization have decried uh, not feeling prepared uh, when they enter the classroom. And it's true that traditionally certified teachers struggle in their first year, but I think we can all imagine that when you have 18 hours or two and a half days of student teaching, you, you're certainly set up to struggle uh, quite a bit more. 
And so, you know, in TFA's defense, they say, well, we're taking the top, you know, achieving students from around the country. And these are people that might not have ever gotten into education, but they're committing to two years. And they have tons of support. There's other activities um, outside the classroom and throughout those two years, which will help them become, you know, really effective teachers. Um, how do you respond to that? Yeah, so I, I hear it a lot that Teach for America um, supporters will suggest that, you know, TFA provides all these sort of uh, external support structures for core members. In in some ways, they do. It, it tends to be a, a once a month professional development session, but. A lot of that narrative assumes uh, that traditionally certified teachers who are not a part of Teach for America don't have those mechanisms in place. In fact, every school district that I've ever been involved with, either as a student teacher or as a teacher, they've had mentor teachers that have been in my classroom more often than TFA. Uh, and so it's a, it's a misleading uh, sort of uh, uh, thing to say that Teach for America provides all this extra support for teachers uh, when, in fact, they don't have a monopoly on doing that. And talk a little bit about the impact of that two-year commitment, because many studies, and for example, my own personal experience, um, you know, being an educator uh, for about five years, uh, working in different classrooms in New York City, um, you know, two years is, for many people, you're just kind of figuring out what you're doing, right? Um, so what kind of impact does that have, not only... Um, on teachers themselves, but on students and communities where you have that high turnover. Um, there is a two-year commitment, and many, I guess the majority of TFA, um, they move on to um, other jobs. And they might be in the educational field, but they move on um, outside of the classroom. Yeah, you know, study after study has confirmed that uh, what really matters most as far as student uh, academic outcomes, right, so graduation rates and test scores, and, and of course we can have a conversation about how myopic test scores are, they're, they're not a really good measurement for actual learning, right? Actually, most of it is in, influenced by outside of school factors, and, and so it's a little disconcerting that Teach for America puts so much focus on fixing bad teachers and fixing bad schools when uh, that's not what the research holds out, but it does show within the research literature that the inside of school factors that matter the most certainly good teachers are. And if there's a revolving door of teachers, that that's exceedingly detrimental uh, to students, right? Because there, there's no investment in the community. Uh, but it also, it, it really undermines the notion of teaching as a profession. Uh, it, it conceptualizes of teaching as a technocratic skill and something of volunteer service. And I'd like to point out, as is often the case, I get uh, pushed back on my critique because I taught for two years and I left the classroom. Uh, though uh, I do still teach, I teach pre-service teachers here at the University of Illinois. And so I've not left the classroom, though I have left the K-12 classroom. The problem is, is the reason that a lot of teachers and good teachers, uh, and even if that might include a few TFA teachers, are leaving the classrooms because of the onslaught of the other education reforms that Teach for America supports, right? So high stakes testing, uh, merit pay, um, pedagogical approaches that teach to the test, the advent of charter schools and, and vouchers. And so all of these things that are making teaching less of a profession, stripping teachers autonomy away, uh, these are the reasons that people are abandoning the K-12 classrooms. It's, it's why I left. But of course, in Teach for America's support of those policies, it opens the door for a need for more Teach for America. And so it's a, a reaffirming and self-fulfilling prophecy in a lot of ways. And uh, so I also wanted to you know, point out that um, it does cost a lot less money to have a, a Teach for America a graduate for two years versus a career-long teacher, right? Because you're talking about um, you know, a 25-year career, that salary is going to go up. You're going to have a pension. You're going to have other benefits to pay out. So for a lot of cash-strapped school districts, you know, they, they love TFA um, because it's going to help them um, pack the classroom. You know, we are, you know, there is a, a teacher shortage in a lot of places like Baltimore. It's not a very attractive place for a lot of people to work because of all the, the social issues that um, exist, the high levels of poverty and crime that exist in Baltimore. Yeah, some of the, the recent work that I've been doing on, on Teach for America, and in fact, a few of my colleagues and I who are also a critical Teach for America alum, we, we just published a study two weeks ago looking at this question. So it's actually, in most cases, if you have the, the, the prospect of filling a single teaching position with either a Teach for America core member uh, or equally experienced or rather uh, inexperienced non-TFA teacher, 
it's actually more expensive uh, to fill that position with Teach for America on the front end because TFA requires non-refundable finder's fees, right? That range anywhere between $2,000 to $5,000 per core member per year. And even if the core member quits, the district is still obligated to pay the rest of that finder's fee to Teach for America. And so on the front end, it is actually more expensive to hire a Teach for America core member. But over the long run, if you're able to reserve those positions uh, to be filled by Teach for America in about in, in some of the, the districts that we looked at in about the eighth or ninth year, there's a shift where it, Teach for America, even with the finder's fees, becomes a cheaper option because, of course, you're constantly resetting the experience level closer to zero. And uh, large districts like uh, New Orleans, for example, where educational reformers totally wiped out the, the teacher labor force. Of course, there have been lawsuits about that. Uh, there are massive savings uh, for using Teach for America because not only did they cut a significant uh, portion of the teaching force, but they were able to shift the experience level of teachers closer to zero and in the process saving tons of money, obviously ignoring what we understand about effective teaching, that it takes many, many years to become an effective teacher. And what impact does this have on teachers' unions? Um, it is a different, it is like a different situation in places like Maryland where all teachers are unionized, um, but in, in, other, in other cities, other large cities, um, charter schools, for example, are not unionized and TFA might not be unionized. Um, what does this high turnaround have on unionism in the teaching profession overall? Sure. Well, I, I think, unfortunately, the United States is having a union problem. The you know, enrollment in unions across the board has been uh, steadily declining for the last few decades. And of course, uh, there are neoliberal politics we can think for that. Uh, but it's true that uh, there are areas uh, where Teach for America core members, uh, as part of their affiliation with the local public district, or as a part of their affiliation in charters, as you pointed out, Maryland, that they're required uh, to have uh, membership in a union. Of course, there are areas where membership is um, voluntary, uh, and there are some conversations about whether Teach for America joins unions, uh, whether they don't. Um, but what we see is a lot of high-profile TFA alums who are, are leaving the classroom after two years, right? They've developed uh, uh, manufactured uh, expertise, if you will, and they take that into the policy arena where they advocate for a very particular type of brand of education reform, right? Namely, uh, to your point, one of them being um, uh, trying to bust up teachers' unions, right? So I'm thinking about Michelle Rees' Students First organization, uh, right, that helped uh, at least fund in, in some ways the Vigara decision in California that not only is looking at taking away teacher tenure, uh, but really trying to undermine teachers' unions. And, and again, I think that the concept or the idea that you could student teach for two and a half days and then become the teacher of record, uh, that certainly challenges and undermines notions of professionalism. And we would never allow um, doctors uh, to operate on anybody with two and a half days of training or lawyers to uh, argue uh, a court case with two and a half days. Uh, and so it's problematic on the front end, but when you look at the alumni who are going into policy positions and they're advocating for these types of anti-union uh, reforms, it's, it's also troubling uh, thinking about the teach, uh, teaching as a profession at large. And in your piece in the Washington Post you had published recently, you note that more than 70 alums of TFA currently hold public office, several more work in the U.S. Department of Education and as congressional advisors. Alumni run the school district is, districts in New York, New York, Newark, sorry, Atlanta, and New Orleans. And you also mentioned Michelle Ree, who was the former school's chancellor in D.C., who sort of fell from grace for her aggressive tactics of firing principals and teachers on camera, which was later televised. And, and a cheating scandal. Yeah, and a massive cheating scandal. Um, so what do we know what the impact of T TFA, uh, other TFA alums who have um, gone gone into these, um, you know, more, uh, have gone into higher positions of power in the education world, what, what impact have they had? Yeah, so it's, um, it, it's a glaring gap in the evidence. It's something that, that needs to be researched more. There was a study that was produced uh, two years ago. It also came out uh, in Educational Policy Analysis Archives. Jacobson and Linkow uh, produced a piece that looked at the messaging, the, the campaign messaging of Teach for America alums who were running for local school board and compared those to uh, their competitors or, and other school board members, their messaging, and found that the Teach for America alums were exceedingly more likely 
uh, to align their rhetoric and, and public messaging uh, to, to be uh, with Teach for America, to be with corporate education reform. And so that's really um, some of the first uh, empirical evidence we have. It's certainly a, an area that needs to be researched more. But I think anecdotally, we can see that a lot of the high uh, profile alums, right, John White in Louisiana, Michelle Reeves, as we noted, right, they're advocating for a very specific type of marketization and privatization of education, right? Expanding Teach for America, which is the privatization of teacher education, expanding charter schools and, and school vouchers, which is privatization in a lot of different ways. And so anecdotally, we have lots of evidence of that happening. Now, uh, sort of, I wanted to end on this note, which I think is important. Um, does Teach for America itself, the policies it, it pushes and advances, do they lead to privatization, or is it just a byproduct? Does, is increased privatization a byproduct of the work they are doing? In other words, are they explicitly trying to privatize public education? I, I think that it's difficult to say that they're doing it explicitly. And I think that that's uh, Teach for America smart, and they understand um, uh, their, how they're incorporated, right? They, they can't, they're non, uh, nonprofit, they can't take. Uh, policy positions overtly or explicitly, but they certainly do um, implicitly in a lot of different ways. Uh, a few of, uh, I'll give you a few examples. Uh, when No Child Left Behind uh, said that every teacher would have to, or excuse me, every student would have to have a highly qualified teacher, uh, it became problematic for Teach for America because, of course, uh, the, the definition of highly qualified didn't include someone who was um, emergency license or alternatively certified or in the process of getting certification, meaning that they don't have a full credential uh, or state license to teach. Uh, in 2010, the only amendment to No Child Left Behind to that date uh, was to uh, tweak the language to include teachers that were currently in training as highly qualified. Uh, of course, there's some anecdotal evidence of Teach for America pushing for that. Uh, of course, uh, through their alumni base and through some of their connections uh, on the Hill to get that amendment passed. It was uh, reauthorized during the debt deal that reopened the federal government in 2013. Uh, and so they've had influence in a lot of uh, covert ways. But I think that as an organization that has 400, and I'm looking at it here, in 2013, 437 million dollars in net assets, so approaching half a billion dollars in net assets, and this is two years ago, who has received, continues to receive money from the federal government, right, so taxpayers like, like you and myself, uh, their conceptualization of teaching is that somebody with two and a half days of student teaching uh, can be or should be uh, a teacher of record, and, and they, of course, they try to suggest now that they're better teachers than uh, folks who've spent uh, four, five, six years training to become a teacher and getting a license before they do that. Uh, and so the, two the organization's rhetoric surrounding teachers and teachers training and teacher training, I think, lends itself uh, to privatization. And of course, uh, the KIPP founders, uh, the Knowledge's uh, as power program, right, the nation's largest uh, charter network being founded by TFA alums, they've been, gone on record saying that they rely on Teach for America as a fresh stream of, or, or as a never-ending stream of fresh blood uh, because they overwork their teachers so hard that it's good to have uh, just a two-year commitment. And so there are a lot of covert ways that TFA is uh, seeking to privatize all of education. Well, we want to thank you so much for joining us and sharing all this insight about Teach for America. We appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you for joining us at The Real News Network.